Hello, everybody at home. Thank you for tuning in to our weekly poetry series. I'm Nicole, the manager at Read It Again Bookstore, and I'm joined tonight by JC Riley and Karen Head. Today is actually Karen's birthday. Happy birthday. And uh, thank you for choosing to celebrate with us. Uh, the way the formatting is going to work tonight, each poet will read for 15 minutes, followed by a discussion on craft. Viewers, feel free to make comments or ask questions throughout, and we'll respond to them at the end of the readings. JC is going to read first, so I'll introduce her. J.C. Riley writes across genres to keep things interesting. What Magic May Not Alter, her Southern Gothic novel in verse, came out this spring from Madville Publishing, and she has work published or forthcoming in the Journal of Compressed Literary Arts, Ponder Review, Waterwheel Review, Freeze Ray Poetry, and Fearsome Critters. When she's not writing or serving as the managing editor of Atlanta Review, she plays tennis, crochets, or practices her Italian. Follow her at Aisha Tonu on Twitter or at jc.riley on Instagram. All right, uh, JC, when you go full screen, you can talk or begin. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me tonight. Um, it's probably going to be backwards. Oh, no, it's forwards. Oh, look at that. Um, I'm going to be reading some poems from my new book. And the things that you should know, I think, about it, uh, and I might have some a few things per each poem to say, but um, it's it's about a family set here in the South, uh, in Louisiana, um, and um, most of the, what happens in here is sort of, um, you know, the they're they're witches, they're uh, religious, um, and um, well. I'll read it to you and you can figure that. Uh, this first poem is called A Stop at Old Wives Oak. Its leaves have turned coal orange and brown as cinnamon crisp. And Maggie is late in planting her one, her true, her daffodil, the wispy bulb paper crinkling in the yawn of afternoon breeze. She's sworn the twins just turn teen to secrecy as she scoops a hole in the earth, then sets the bulb like a cleanly diadem in its cache and pulls for their opinion. Lula snorts cicada sharp, goes back to her whittling, but Vidalia softens like a lemon cream, a dream of romance and her teeth nibbling at her lip. It's perfect. She beams at her elder sister, and Maggie smooths the last of the dirt on top, says a spell for winter to be kind and spring to be kinder yet. May what dwells here now in warmer months bring felicity, she thinks. As for her sister's sowing wishes, how far off some day seems. Maggie envisions that yellow bloom, thick with promise. The oak gleams a bright fire, shakes off its leaves like magic. So there are three sisters, although the twins are the main sisters. That's Tallulah and Vidalia. Um, and since baseball has just started, I have a baseball poem in here. Um, and this is based on uh, something true. In the early 20s, the Yankees came down to Shreveport to play spring training. So um, this is based on a, a real story. Spring Training, Shreveport, Louisiana, March 12th, 1921. Oh, and I should say that there's a whole bunch of names at the beginning, and they're all part of the, the family. Um, leaping to their feet, Bonham, Calvin, and Stonewall chant along with the crowd, Home run! Home run! Vi and Maggie rise politely beside their bows, while Lula stands on her seat, bracing against her brother to see past Bonham's greasy head. There he is, Babe the Mighty. He struts from the dugout, extends a southpaw wave to 4,000 fans, and picks up two bats, as if weighing which will send the horse hide further over the fence of Gasser Park. He tosses one aside, steps into the batter box, waits for Watson's windup and release. Ruth windmills, but the ball powers into Green Ace's mitt. Strike one! At Watson's small town heater, he smirks. Is that all you got? The big boy swings, spins clean off his feet, and lands on his red clay dusty keister. Strike two. Watson's last pitch, too low and slow for the Bambino to play 
to pay it much notice, dawdles over the plate like Granny B on her way home from church. Strike three, you're out. The fellows slump down in the bleachers and groan like they've eaten too much cotton candy and Cracker Jack. The rest of the crowd groans too. The fence, the fans have to hope another, another inning will let fly the Sultan's home run voodoo. Lula pounds a fist in the air and shouts, Get your eyes checked, Moriarty. Anyone can see that ball was polishing his shoes while your strike zone's the size of Bozier City. Vi rolls her eyes, and Maggie, worried what Calvin must think, shushes her. But Lula continues to heckle the ump till Moriarty flicks off his mask. It flaps in his hand like a mad crow. Listen, sister, you put a sock in it or you're out of here too. Wally knuckleballs her mouth full of popcorn before she can respond. About to leave the plate, Ruth scans the crowd to see who started the racket. Spotting Lula still tall in her seat, he flourishes his cap and bows. The crowd cheers half-heartedly as he wanders back to the dugout. Even a legend isn't a legend all the time. I, it's amazing that Babe Ruth went to Shreveport, if you ask me. Um, this one's called Familiar. Her sisters have spent the better part of Saturday preparing for the Sodality Spring Dance while Lula, in overalls, hides in the hayloft with her notebook and her pen, trying out some new lines that will never sound like those she's read in Michael Robarte's And the Dancer. What does she know of uprisings and apocalypse? At her feet, the latest, bunch of, the latest batch of barn cats, more anarchy loosed upon the world, bask in an old horse blanket and some flannel bunting. Proud Papa Figgy, an arc of smoke, stretches beside Ross Murta as she nurses four torties and a nimbus-colored male Lula's already nicknamed Chance, short for Cloudy with the Chance. Their small squeaks and purrs distract a moment from words that come sludge, dull and slow, and from the sting of sister sympathy. Oh, but if he'd asked, would some kind of magic be at hand? Would Sibley magic be at hand? Likely, and Lula would have turned any turned any young man down just in case his will was coaxed. She bends to tickle Chance's belly, the vapor soft fur almost a revelation. He looks at her, his topaz eyes, bright sunlight streaking through a thunderhead. Another revelation that his will might be coaxed by her. I am yours written as if automatically on a fresh, fresh page in her book. That poem riffs on uh, Yeats. Um, there are other poems in here. They're not all, uh, they're not all um, directly involved with the story of the family. Here's one. Uh, one of the sisters to Lula is not much of a witch, but she is a, a poet. And so there are some poems in here that are supposed to be her, uh, her poems. And they all have to do with the uh, full moon. Pink moon, the moss pinks that creep wild in meadows and along the house at Holly Arm give you your name. Though you are white as ever against April's impudent darkness, your veil upon the pinks and her, your votary, Gleams like bone, like the ruffled edge of the queen conch shell she found at Grand Isle four summers ago, like snail pass on sidewalks, like ghost frosted breath. Their petals, notched hearts, reach for you in swaying aves, hers a deeper red. She lifts towards you in entreaty, implores too much for love. Beaver Moon. Like a gash in the dam of night, you flood the fields with a white water rush of splendor. The sear grasses that concede your weight, bowing and wave like with November's wheezing chill. The girl, without coat and company and thin, so thin, 
strays into this current as if to court the balm and counsel you offer all such votaries. Before, when she's come, she worked her gift through you, but prodigious tears and a flickering spirit prevent petition tonight. You conjure the creatures of light to her side, let her drown in pelts of sudden sleep. So um, the sister, Vidalia, the, the good practicing witch, she, um, she goes a little crazy after her boyfriend is very evil to her. And so they put her in a sanitarium. And this is a poem when she's there. Contraband. The white army had rummaged through her cash again. Oh, the white army, I should say, is what she calls the nurses. The white army had rummaged through her cash again, discover Lula's hanky full of Althea and agrimony, pine needles and plantain leaf, sacrifice the lot to compost. To cloak anything well in such a cell, too small even for a proper chest, even for sunlight most days, required more cunning than she laid claim to, and those women could outsly a skulk of foxes. Vidalia half smiled, the plantain leaf was Lula's little joke, its power to thwart marauding hands more superstition than truth. But the others she found use for, to counter jinx the mutterings of the frost-lipped nurses, stiff as meringues in their uniforms, or to attract the benevolent spirits that surely, even here in this sad refuge on a hill, could ease the thoughts of wayward reason and scour hearts like hers petrified to stone till they gleamed. This one is Beatitude. Purple drifts of myrtle blooms plucked off by the squall edge the muddy street as Lula walks the last few steps from Highland to the trolley stop. Not one of their better visits, with Vi so eked a spirit, she seemed translucent as powdered milk and water when Lula gets the proportions wrong. Tales of new kittens could not rouse her, nor a pocket full of rhymes, nor buttercups bundled with juniper sprigs and fairy wand to tide her through the next moon. The kingdom of heaven may be Vi's one day, but no time soon. Crackling on its wire, the trolley stops before her and she boards. As the driver rings the bell, a rush of blossoms startles from the trees. Well, I read those faster than I thought I would. Uh, sorry about that. Um, let me... Uh, dead airspace, what everyone wants to hear. Well, I'll read, I'll read the first one. Uh, this is a, this is a, a poem with, um, oops, this is the wrong poem. Sorry. Uh, this is a poem about the, a picture. Um, and if you can see the front, um, it, this was a picture that I uh, found in an antique store. Um, so I was sort of imagining um, the, the family. So this is Summer Portrait, 1912. In dark suits and matching robin's egg washed gray ties, Benton and Stonewall, straight backed as young oaks, stand on the porch stairs, one behind Mama and the other behind Granny B. Wally, a head taller than Benton, but two years younger, laughs. At a joke, perhaps. Or dog chasing a squirrel off camera. The corner of Benton's mouth turn up too, but his eyes stray heavenward, though it's four years until the seminary. Mama's smile is all teeth, but not horsey. How like a Gibson girl she looks in her new frock, not unlike when she was married. The beading on her shirt waist twinkles with the sun and may surely leave fairy flares on the film. 
The pleats of her skirt stay fresh pressed despite the heat. She cuddles Ross Murta, then only a kitten, and doesn't mind the cat hair. Granny B cocks her head to the left, her lips twitching as she tries to hold back a cackle. 20 years out of date, leg of mutton sleeves on her black bombazine hover like planets to either side of her, and Cole, sitting on her knee, seems to fall into their orbit his wide moon face almost dwarfed by their expanse. Magnolia, a little thin, stands between the elder boys, her glossy hair drawn back into a bow the size of angel wings. Freckles dapple her cheeks prettily, though some of the detail will be lost in noon sunshine. The twins, tall for their age and fluffy as meringues in yards of white ruffled lawn, hold hands before her. Vi's heart-shaped face peeps through a curtain of corkscrew curls, but her expression is welcoming as an open window. Only Lula, as if she's turned her head at the last moment, avoids the camera's gaze. She is smiling too, but at what she'd never say. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was awesome. I, I love the, the narrative arc of it all. That's great. Um, Okay, so next up, Karen is going to read, so I'll introduce her. Um, Karen Head is the author of Disrupt This, as well as four books of poetry called Sassing, My Paris Year, Shadow Boxes, and On Occasion. She co-edited the poetry anthology Teaching as a Human Experience and has exhibited several acclaimed digital poetry projects, including Monumental, which was detailed in a Time Online mini documentary. In 2010, she won the Oxford International Women's Festival Poetry Prize. She has held residencies at the Hambidge Center for the Creative Arts and Sciences and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts France and has taught abroad in Barcelona and Oxford. She serves as editor of the Atlanta Review and as secretary for the Poetry Atlanta Board of Directors. She is currently the Poet Laureate of Waffle House as well as Associate Chair and an Associate Professor in the School of Literature, Media and Communication at Georgia Tech, where she also serves as the Executive Director of the Novel Communication Center. For 15 years, she's been a visiting artist and scholar at the Institute for American Studies in Dortmund, Germany and a new and selected collection called Perspective is currently being translated into three languages, English, German, and French, and the Taiwanese version of Lost on Purpose is coming out next year. Uh, Karen is a native of Atlanta where she lives with her very English husband, Colin Potts. Thanks. Okay. So, um, I have to say that in all these years, this is a first. Um, I've never actually read on my birthday, so I'm glad that that folks are here. Um, and um, if anybody wants to help me further celebrate my birthday, then I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of JC's new book because it is marvelous. Um, JC and I have known each other uh, since 2000. Um, we um, started a PhD program together and we were, um, on the very first day, essentially, of, of classes that year, um, we had a poetry seminar with Greg Kuzma. And um, Greg was a very eclectic and talented writer and an amazing poetry teacher. But he, um, he walked into class that day and he had on a baseball cap and it just said anxiety. And um, I think JC and I sort of looked at each other and she kind of winked and I knew that, I knew that we were gonna be friends. Um, so I thought I would actually read, um, start out reading a poem that connects the two of us, um, because this is a poem about the two of us in Lincoln at an estate sale. Estate sale, Palm Sunday, Lincoln, Nebraska. More than a hundred people trampled the newly greening yard, pawning at the items, lining tables, stacked on the ground, even hanging from tree limbs. Her name is Mary. She just moved to a nursing home. My friend bought a chair, a regal scalloped backed number in gold crushed velvet, only 50 cents. I picture Miss Mary perched on the edge of that chair in the front room on Sundays, drinking coffee with friends and family. Where are they now? I think about skipping church, the palm fronds, Jesus entering Jerusalem in triumph only a few days from his crucifixion. I begin bidding against everyone, driving up prices, leave with three Japanese stamp prints in decaying frames, $32. 
So, um, so yeah, I thought that I would read some birthday poems. Um, these are from my collection, Sassing, and that is actually me. Um, and in the center of Sassing, there is um, a group of poems that uh, take their titles from the number one song from the week of my birth every year, um, sort of an exercise that I, I did. Um, and sometimes you get lucky. The year that I was born, uh, the number one song that week was Light My Fire by The Doors. Light My Fire, 1967. Coltrane died the week I was born. Sheets of sound pulled too tight for me to hear outside the incubator walls, as if in an empty theater, I arrived too late to the show, still missed him, just missed his expression, the stellar regions of Altissimo, audible only to dogs and babies. In the spiritual shrill, I wailed after him, wanted to leave before I'd really come, but the nurse cranked the radio by her desk and the lizard king callously crooned. The time to hesitate is through, no time to wallow in the mire. Come on, baby. And so I did. So I'm gonna be sort of-ish reading some things that are kind of chronological. Um, I picked July poems, birthday poems, um, poems that somehow were, were on that theme. Um, and, uh, this one is called um, Mayday Sermon. And uh, in addition, in this collection, there are a group of poems by very famous male Southern writers. And I take the theme of their poem and the title, and then I rewrite it from a woman, a much younger woman's perspective. So Mayday Sermon in response to James Dickey. Listen, O daughters, turn, turn. No. Not May, not hot enough for fiery conversions. It was late July. The smell of chicken houses drifting through the open windows, the church piano, strings stressed atonal, popsicle stick advertising fans flapping off beat, one side Christ night cooled in the shade of Gethsemane, the other side the new porch at Ingram's funeral parlor. It was a Friday and I was only just days short of 16. His name? was Bobby, and he would leave in another year off to engineering school, his mind always full of pure science. But tonight, his curiosity had excited my mama into believing that there might finally be a good Christian boy in my future. It was only a matter of weeks before a future film student would come back from Texas the summer with his father, full of mystery beyond anything I'd found in church, complete with his jazz shoes that made everybody think he was gay. I would choose him over Bobby for my homecoming date, and his car would break down, and we wouldn't get our photo made at the dance, and after I drove him home in my mother's car, he would ask if I wanted to fool around, and I would say no. A few years later, we'd have the same conversation, and he would show me his journal where he wrote that he dreamed I was on fire, and the entry would be on the same date my ex-husband doused me with developing fluid, and again, I would say no. But here I was with Bobby in a whitewashed clapboard country church during summer revival, and the three preachers had been at it for hours, and everyone was singing, just as I am without one plea. And the preacher was waving his arms in the air and bellowing, come sinner, come home. And that's when it happened. Wanda, a church matron, spied Bobby and made a beeline for him. Boy, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your eternal savior? Bobby glanced over his shoulder at me and I tried to say, run. Next thing I knew, he was up front, down on his knees, and I couldn't get near him because there was a circle of folks praying over him. All I could think of was get me out of here. I wanted to scream, he is a Unitarian, but I choked on an old time silence. All I could feel was my own baptism in the mossy concrete pool out back of the church filled every Sunday by the local fire department, Brother Morgan pushing me under my dress pinned between my legs so it wouldn't float up. Then the preacher hollered at Bobby, give your heart over to the Lord, son. 
Eventually, they gave up when Bobby couldn't see what they wanted him to see. And when we drove home, he laughed, but I just wanted to cry. We fooled around for a few weeks, but it never got past third. And I dumped him out of pure shame. Brother Jim, you know damn well there ain't any women preachers in Gilmer County. And even if there were, they wouldn't have to warn young women about lust and murder and riding off into the night naked on a motorcycle man between their knees. Because that night late in July, during my 16th year, I was just one county over. Just a few years past my own drowning and the new dry dress for the photos. And I could tell you then what I know now for sure. You don't need your daddy to string you up in a barn to beat the sin out of you because the sin swirls like a spring tornado from the moment you gasp into this world. And the only thing that separates men and women is that the women know that neither love nor God can save you from some things. So I will move um, to my book, My Paris Year. Um, and, uh, Again, read a book. So this uh, poem is actually reflecting on, on being 23. And since I turned 53 today, I thought that that would be a good one. Um, it, it takes its cue um, from the J. Peterman catalog, which I'm a, a long term sort of um, super fan of. Um, and it's about uh, if you don't know the J. Peterman catalog, they write these elaborate stories about their products. And this starts with an epigraph, which is the description of, of the item. Marie Antoinette nightshirt, number 1019, price $39. No lace, no embroidery, no goo pure Pima cotton, the best there is. French, white, fresh, crisp, innocent, four button placket, band collar, shirt tail hem, sleep in it, walk along beaches in it, visit a secluded meadow in it. J. Peterman. The catalog copy was alluring. The price reasonable enough for a 23 year old with seduction on her mind. Innocent, maybe. Back then I wasn't confident enough to use the simple things in my favor. Instead, I should have splurged, bought a pink negligee that would have clung perfectly to the curves of my body. Shirt tail hymns I would learn look better in the morning when wearing only an Oxford cloth button down, I let my lover make breakfast in a reality where I have traded fairy tale for sang froid. 17 years ago, I was pretending a kind of sensual simplicity. Of course, it failed me. Just as Versailles failed Marie. And politics aside, don't we all wish that she'd had more time for the fantasy that might have been her life? So yeah, um, I wrote these poems when I, the year I turned 40. So, you know, it's a little, little longer than 17 now. Um, so uh, my uh, newest book, Lost on Purpose, um, this book, uh, I'll read a couple of things from that. Um, I believe it was five years ago when I was actually at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts in France, which is in a small village called Ovalar. Uh, I was there for my birthday and um, I went to dinner at a local village at a really lovely restaurant. And this is a this is actually a prose poem uh, about that experience. Landscape. We are four courses into the tasting menu when the cheese trolley arrives at Les Auberges de Bardic. The mosaic of milk, a couple of pyramids among partial wheels in creamy whites punctuated by the occasional flash of green, blue, and gray is a tale of the local landscape. One of the village cats, modeled in the same colors, jumps onto the limestone wall surrounding the terrace. Our waitress wanders down the road with a tray of drinks for a group of men playing petanque. It is nearly midnight. I feel your leg brush against mine. On our way here, we pulled the car off the road in a field of sunflowers. Van Gogh was not hyperbolic. Ochre waves undulate for miles. I stood on the edge of the field. The tail of my black linen dress flirted with the stalks. For a moment, I felt as if I could let those cyclops engulf me. But with the snap of your camera, I was captured 
again. And I wrote this actually at Hambage. Walking in the Northeast Georgia mountains just before my 50th birthday. Maybe I'm just tapping into my inner Wendell Berry, James Dickey, or Bill Stafford, but nature sure can be hard to ignore. Case in point, this morning on my walk to the Creek Falls at Patterson Gap, I came across a raccoon. He seemed to be taking a nap or maybe recuperating from a wild night out with the boys. He had the look of some of the guys I've slept with, cute but disheveled, the beginning of a gut peeking out between jeans and flannel shirt, skin scent of charcoal burnt ribs mixed with polo cologne and a penchant for leaning against cars, trees, and riding lawnmowers. I could imagine him drinking a PBR. I kept my distance even though he seemed harmless enough. On the way back, I couldn't help myself, nudged a little closer, saw black flies buzzing a halo over him. The driver who hit this little guy probably never saw him, or maybe it was a blatant hit and run, hard to say. Barney, because at this point, he has to have a name, right? Yes, Barney's tail atop a dewy bed of thistle was majestic which put me in mind of one of my earliest boyfriends who wore a coontail keychain on his back right belt loop. Sometimes you just know things aren't right, but it may take you years to figure out why. And um, we, uh, we mentioned, uh, or, or Cole was kind enough to mention that I have a new and selected um, collection that's coming out and so I'm going to end with this one. Um, there's a, a, a language uh, warning. So if, if small small ones are listening, you might want to you know, click mute for a minute. Um, and this one um, is for all my students who've ever studied with me, um, especially creative writing students. Uh, and it's the title poem from the from the new and selected perspective. And it has an epigraph from White Snake. I don't know where I'm going, but I sure know where I've been. It's 1987 and my new fuck you world anthem is Here I Go Again by White Snake, which I play over and over on the Sony Discman that's riding shotgun in my $400 cash 76 Mercury Capri. With a number of unpredictable and predictable accidents ahead, I'm shifting gears, windows down, cruising along the Chattahoochee behind Eagles Landing subdivision. Imagining myself as Tawny Katane, somersaulting between jaguars, thinking the height of success is having a rock star with hair bigger than mine big, stick his tongue down my throat. Today, I write with perspective longer than the fake nails I used to have. I catch a replay of the video on YouTube, notice for the first time that those boys, if you stripped them and shaved them bald, would fall heavy like Samson. And Tawny, I'd teach her to write poetry, dance naked in metaphor. But before any of that can happen, my brakes will fail and I'll slam into an embankment totaling what's left of my youth. Thanks. Thank you, that was fantastic. Uh, I really liked all the all the challenges that you set for yourself. It made me want to go and do do the same thing. That's fun. Um, okay, so next up comes the discussion discussion portion of the evening, and we can open that up to any audience questions as well. So if anybody has anything they'd like to ask, either uh, JC or Karen, just post in the comments, and we'll try to address it. Um, do either of you have any questions you'd like to ask each other? Yes, JC, <laughs> what would you like to ask me? <laughs> There's so many things. <laughs> okay. I hadn't thought about the uh, I hadn't thought about us at that estate sale. You left that chair behind in your in your office at I did, Lincoln, didn't you? Yeah. It, it was a great it was, chair. It was one of the worst things I've ever did to leave that chair. <laughs> Okay. But I had to leave it for the the um, the other grad students who were in that room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you both uh, had a lot of narrative in both of your poems. Uh, could either of you talk about how you work towards narrative in your poetry? Or what role you think like narrative plays in strengthening a poem? Um, well, I think for me, um, you know, it's just sort of part of that tradition of Southern literature, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I come from a, a, a family of folks who sat on porches, um, you know, you know, my, my, both my mom and dad's families, you know, were, were poor, you know, working class folks, salt of the earth, great, you know, great people. Um, and, and, but, but, you know, they didn't have a lot and, and we spent lots and lots of time and certainly growing up. Um, whenever I would visit, my dad was in the military, so we, we moved around a lot, but when we would visit, you know, we were always sitting on someone's porch and someone was always telling a story. And I remember at one point, um, listening to, to Terry Hummer talk about, you know, the, the Greek notion of, of verse as an agricultural term, you know what I mean? You know, go till down to the end of the row, turn around and come back. And, um, and I think that, that, that really is kind of at the heart of a lot of, of my poetry. I tend to, um, to be a storyteller. Now, I'm not really a fiction writer. I, I go as far as prose poems um, and I do creative nonfiction, but apparently if I want to lie, I have to do it in a poem. Um, JC, on the other hand, actually does write fiction. So she has more to say, I think, about how that informs her work. But for me, it's, um, yeah, I, it's just, uh, you know, I'm a natural storyteller, but I'm also not a fiction writer. And so then that kind of leaves me being a poet who has to tend towards the narrative. Mm -hmm. I think for me, um, I, I'm with Karen, you know, grow up in the South, stories are just what you, you live and breathe. Um, I, I do write fiction sometimes. Um, I don't have, uh, I don't have the stamina to really write long fiction. Mm -hmm. So um, the things that I write tend to be shorter. And I think part of that's also just being a poet you know, you sort of get in, get out. It's like one page and you've, you've said all you need to say. And if it goes on to the next page, it damn well better be great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think, um, I think storytelling is just, is really who we, who we are, um, especially as Southern writers, you know, you, you just can't, you just can't escape it. Mm -hmm. Do you treat a uh, narrative differently when you're writing fiction versus when you're writing poetry? Um, for me, I, I would say not so much. I think it's still the same kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the thing with my book is, um, it, it didn't get put together. It, you know, it, it wasn't written sort of linearly. It was, mm -hmm. it was, I would bring a poem here and people like Karen was, was in my writing group. She, they would be like, well, what about this? And I think, oh yeah, okay, I'll, I'll try that. And so it, it was very much, um, you know, I, I, I did think of the whole arc of the, the book, but each poem I thought had to be its own kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's own, it had to tell a story within a page and sometimes a page and a half, but uh, otherwise, you know, it, it, they were all individuals that got stuck together because I had a writing group that was like, come on, write some more. Mm -hmm. JC is being very um, humble. She's created an entire universe. I mean, like Faulkner um, did. And it, she has this entire landscape of place and she has this whole like family tree. And the way that these poems come together into a single whole, um, it's like a novel in verse and it is, it really is brilliant. Um, well, thank you, Karen. That was very generous of you to say that. And you said it all started with the, with the photograph that you found. Is that where it began? Um, no, I don't know where it started, but um, when I saw that I was starting to write these um, more and more, I thought, well, let me get inspiration from um, old phot photographs. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's where like they, they came from. And so I'm so happy that one of the ones I found, you know, it was like, it was an expensive photo. It was like $3. Hmm. Um, I was happy it was the cover. Mm -hmm. So you had other photos that you were also drawing from? I had lots of photos, um, you know, to, to see what people were wearing, mm -hmm. but, um, I didn't, I didn't write, 
I didn't write poems based on a photo, I, I mm -hmm. should say. So it's not ecrastic poetry where it's based on a photo, it's just inspired by elements of it. Yeah, you know, okay. just want to see what, you know, if you're writing about the past, and I'm writing, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, mm -hmm. you, you need to have the things from the past around you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's a question from Colin who asks, when will Karen's new and selected collection be out and who is publishing it? Uh, it's, um, it's still being, it's still being translated right now and it will be translated through the end of the year. They have to have finished. Um, it's supposed to come out next year, um, from the, uh, Centre de Lèvre in France. Um, or at least that's, um, there's a chance that, a one publisher in France may, may do it and one publisher in Germany may do it. Um, but uh, the, the folks who are translating it, ha their ongoing contract for doing uh, translating American poets is actually with the, the Centre de Lèvre. So um, yeah, and, the, and then Lost on Purpose, the Taiwanese um, translation is also coming out um, early next year. So, um, but unless you read Chinese, <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you do, hey, I'll, you know, I can, I can point you on how to get a copy. And uh, so JC was talking about surrounding yourself with elements of the past. What do you surround yourself with, uh, Karen, to draw inspiration from? Yeah, um, you know, I think that, that for me, it's, I really am a thief. Uh, I didn't. I didn't actually read uh, one of my poems that talks about um, how all, I have a line that says all poets are, are thieves. Um, I'm always listening for that that sort of incongruous detail, that thing that sticks. It's like Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. Um, and I'm very attentive and notice things that other people don't. I'm also um, an inveterate eavesdropper. Um, <laughs> And so is JC actually. <laughs> Not me. Um, and it's there. There have been occasions when she and I have been eating in a restaurant, and we're not sure if we're eavesdropping on the same conversation or not. Um, but um, I think it's that. And I ask, I actually write acrostic poetry as well, so I have a fair number of poems. And so, like you know, all those poems about music, and then poems about other you know that take their cues from other poets, and um, and then pieces of art. Uh, I'm married to a photographer and we actually collaborate together. And so um, we do series where that's actually what I was in at VC, VCCA France. We were there together um, doing a project where we get a theme um, and then I write a poem, he goes and takes a photograph and then we start switching. And so I'll respond to the photograph. And so it creates two streams. I um, mean, it's always interesting to see where, where, those, where those come from or how mm -hmm. those go. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. Um, yeah, I noticed that there were, were a lot of like music elements in, in, your, in your poetry. That's always, the overlap between poetry and music is always very strong. Because um, music is poetry. Um, you, you guys both also talked about chronology um, in your poems. And uh, what role do you think time does or does not play? Like. In, in poetry, like things can be taken out of time or do you think time is always present in poetry or is it fun to play with time? Um, That's a hard question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I think time is is certainly um, essential to, to what we're writing. I mean, if you're storytelling, stories have an order um, and so, you know, it is kind of important to, to be sort of, to have a sense of time when you're, when you're telling a story in a poem or whatever, um, you know, you, well, I mean, you can tell things out of time, but then, uh, you know, that's sort of experimental and that's sort of way over my head. But, um, I try to, I, I guess I can't help being, um, timely. Or, yeah, in my writing, I think, it, I mean, it's narrative, right? So I tend to just, you know, this happens, then this happens, then this happens. So Karen, I think for you? me, you know, I think for me, I focus less on time. I mean, time is 
I mean, you're, you're always in some place in time. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes it's important that readers understand what that time marker is. Sometimes it doesn't matter at all. Um, but for me, the more overarching issue is place. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think I think of myself as a Southern writer. Um, you know, Eudora Welty talked famously about how place is kind of always the, the, the consideration in Southern literature. And I think that whether that place is actually the South or whether that place is somewhere else, um, I'm always very interested in how place controls what's happening. And so, I mean, my Paris year is a collection of poems that of course are for the most part all about Paris. Um, and then um, Lost on Purpose is a book that's really, I mean, it's broken into three sections. And so there's, there's an entire section on the UK. My, my husband is English. Um, and me learning English culture and my English family. Um, my brother's married to a Dutch woman, so I have family in the Netherlands, and, and I have obviously my friends and colleagues in Germany, um, and I've lived and taught in Barcelona. And so um, there's a continental section that sort of you know takes up the rest of Europe, and then um, and then there's a section back here in the U.S. And and I've also now started writing some poems about. Um, being, you know, one of the, the the guest poets at the Formosa Poetry Festival in Taiwan, and so for me, when I go to a place, I'm always interested in what can that place teach us, what can that place tell us, and how can I use that um, to sort of reach out and and do something. And the and for me, the poetry that I like the most kind of does that. And so. Um, Ilya Kaminsky's brilliant book, Deaf Republic, mm -hmm. does that really well. I mean, that is, you know, it's a very specific place and it is a specific time as well, but but what he does in that and how he he takes that, but he frames it outside of of of, of the Ukraine and, and, you know, the sort of, you know, Russian sort of experience. Um, he you know, he doesn't, he doesn't end there. He ends back here. Um, and he, and he uses that story to then really give a wallop. I mean, the last poem of that book just absolutely is so amazing and strong. And, you know, he, he, he forces you to see that, that time actually doesn't really change things mm. all that much. And so, um, so for me, I think it's always that, how do you find the universality in the experiences of all these different places. And so I try to, to leverage leverage place to do that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tend to think of place as an element of grounding, uh, which is kind of necessary with like the abstract nature of poetry. Are there other things that you guys use to like ground your poetry so it doesn't go away into metaphor? Well, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, it's a bad thing if you go away. I mean, that last sure. poem, I have, I have the line, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to teach her how to dance, you know, to dance in metaphor. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, um, I mean, I, I think I do come from the, from the, 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 uh, the Williams notion of no ideas, but in things hmm. um, for me. Now that doesn't mean that, that, all great poetry has to do that. I mean, you know, JC talked about experimental poetry and language poetry, and there are a lot of people who are doing other kinds of things. And um, it's not that I don't find that appealing, but um, I mean, some of that work is 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 really interesting. But it's not it's not really how my mind works, and it's not the way I want to tell the stories that I want to tell. So for me, it's um, I'm, I'm just using metaphor in a different way. It's not that it isn't there. It's just that um, I don't think you can. I mean, yeah, you can you can certainly let metaphor get away from you, but I think that, uh, and that's one of the hard things when you teach creative writing, mm. um, you know, that that notion. Well, you know, I just said something, and it sounds poetic, so it must be a poem. Um, mm. Maybe it's working, maybe it's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what do you think, JC? Um, I, I'm sort of, I I don't know about metaphor to be honest like i i i use it but it's very deliberate it's it's not it's not very natural to me mm -hmm. um because i think i am much more um uh, i don't know how to say this i'm much more like on the page it, you know what you see is what you get 
Mm -hmm. um, and if if metaphor and comes out of that, you know, if, if, if it sort of becomes something more, well, that's great. But it's it doesn't come naturally to me. Mm. Um, yeah, um, that makes sense. I mean, other other sort of poetic things um, come to me more easily. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, what were, or who were some of the poets who first got you both interested in poetry? It's always such a dangerous question because you know, you're, <laughs> You kind of you kind of just go to the dead people because then like you don't get in any trouble for leaving out your your friends and colleagues who are alive and who inspire you. Um, you know, everybody always says, "What's your favorite poem?" I have many. Um, I think that you know I started writing poetry when I was six years old. I, I, what I will tell you is that my inspiration was my first grade teacher, who kind of got us interested in this idea of poetry, and I think. I've spent my life writing poetry, and I believe that um, I believe that it's uh, it's something that 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 people can tap into. Um, it's not that everybody is going to be a great poet. Um, the, the Ted Kuzer, who JC and I both studied with in Nebraska, um, was pretty famous for saying, um, "Everybody wants to be a poet. Being a poet is sexy." Hmm. The actual work of writing poetry, on the other hand, um, the down and dirty of doing the work is work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, when I read something and I think, wow, I wish I'd written that. And I can see how incredibly well crafted it is. And I can see the work. I can see the down and dirty work that went into making that poem great. That's inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's come from a lot of people because there's a lot of really great work out there. True. I think it inspires me. Oh, you inspire me. <laughs> um, you know, I came to poetry, you know, in college, let's say. Um, and, you know, being an English major, you, you read all the famous dead white people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have Wordsworth shoved down your throat a million times and you, you start to think, well, you know, Wordsworth's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of what I studied was what I thought of good poetry was. Um, and it has changed, right? Because, uh, you know, I can't write Wordsworth worth a damn, but um, I can certainly appreciate them but I, you know, I spend so much time now reading contemporary poets mm -hmm. that, you know, if I do look at an old tiny Wordsworth poem, I'm like, oh, that's that's so quaint. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's good. But it, it's it's, you know, it's not it's not the kind of stuff that I read now. Mm -hmm. Well, well I, sorry, go ahead, Karen. That's OK. Uh, what I was going to say is um, what I hope that. Um, is going to happen more um, now that we are paying attention to, well, some people are paying attention uh, to all the ways that black lives matter, mm -hmm. black artists matter, black writers matter. Um, and I think the fact that it's great to teach Wordsworth, but we also need to be teaching people who weren't historically taught Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about inspirational writers, I mean, you know, um, when I think about writers like Terrence Hayes or, or Rita Dove, or, um, you know, I mean, you can just sort of, you know, go on, you know, I mean, and, and I kind of take for granted because I've now been in the poetry world for a long, a long enough time. And because I studied it and that's what my PhD is in. And then I've taught a lot of contemporary poetry and I know a lot of, of writers and I'm an editor. Um, I kind of sometimes forget that the general public maybe isn't as informed about those reading lists as they should be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are just so, and I mean, it's great to see things like, you know, that, you know, when, when Natasha Trethway became poet laureate and Tracy K. Smith and Jericho Brown, you know, winning the Pulitzer this year. And, um, uh, you know, I sort of, you know, think back because, before Jericho changed his name and he was just a brand new sort of first year graduate student, I was actually um, 
the chair of the graduate student reading for SAMLA for the mm -hmm. South Atlantic Modern Language Association meeting here in Atlanta. And I had chosen his work as one of the five graduate students um, who was going to read that year. And, you know, he just sort of came in and this like, you know, and he, and he said, you know, I hope it's, he, well, he actually, he said, Hey baby, that was like the first <laughs> words that he ever said to me. And then he said, you know, he said, I changed my name. Is that okay with you? And I was like, well, yeah, like it doesn't really have anything to do with me that you changed your name. Right. Um, but I remember even back then I read his work and thought this guy is good. Like mm -hmm. this, this guy is going somewhere and it's kind of, you know, nice that, you know, I can tell that story and be like, yeah, I knew before everybody, you know, like, and I, and, I, and I was not the first one to discover that he was amazing because he was already in grad school and people knew that. But I just think that um, we have to work harder to promote those voices um, and to encourage people to to do to do the to do that reading, because there are just so many, many, many brilliant writers of color. And we need to be nurturing that in the schools and nurturing that and how we're teaching and in and sort of you know, programs for, for young people and programs in schools, bringing the arts in. We need to make sure that they're given those opportunities because, because there are voices there and we don't need to lose them because we have lost a lot of voices yeah. um, historically. So, um, and I mean, I'm a first gen student. So, you know, uh, I, I really take it very seriously. You know, education is, trans is transformational in lots of ways. And for me, one of those things is that, you know, I got the opportunity to learn about a lot of things I would never have known about. And so mm -hmm. with that comes the responsibility for me to go out into the world and say, these are people you need to know about. Right. Uh, well, to end our program for tonight, what are some of the people that we should know about or what are you reading right now? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'll be really honest, the pandemic is hard. Mm -hmm. um it's i'm having a very difficult time writing uh and um jc and i of course uh work together on atlanta review and we've been reading we've been reading those poems mm. um trying to keep to keep that going along um but i've actually kind of been reading escapist fiction i'll i'll just tell the truth mm -hmm. um because um because i really I, you know, the TV that I watch, like all of the stuff I'm consuming right now when I'm not working, when I'm not thinking about the really horrible things that are going on in the world right now, I'm kind mm -hmm. of, I'm kind of going to happy land. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. You can name those things too. The audience <laughs> needs a happy land too. <laughs> So, um, and so I, I, I read a, I read a really lovely book called The Offing. Um, which is actually has a poetry connection because it's there's a part of the storyline ultimately becomes about a woman who was a really great poet. And it's set in um, the north of England where my my husband's uh, mother's family is from. And um, she just passed away at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And I sort of found that book and um, really, really, really enjoyed it immensely. So I would recommend the offing. Um, I do think that if people haven't read Jericho's uh, new collection of poems or Ilya's mm -hmm. collection of poems that they should be reading those. Um, this one here. This yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I read, um, and I always forget her name. I read this really dark, uh, sort of darkish piece of fiction from Scandinavia. Um, <laughs> she's, um, She's uh, she's she's famous for writing children's stories, um, uh, the Moomins, um, oh, and, she, mm -hmm. and um, her name is just escaping me. And so is the name of the book. But um, she wrote a sort of um, adult novel about uh, about this small fishing village, um, which was which was really interesting. I mean, it's not, it wasn't like you know super 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 dark, but it was it was it was, was darkish and very odd. Um, so, you know, in that sense, I've been reading actually some non-American authors. Um, I'm an Americanist, so I kind of get stuck that way sometimes. Right. Um, yeah. I think the, uh, the Newman's author is, uh, Tove Jansen. Yes. Tove Jansen. And, um, yeah, just, and then just some, some fluff stuff that honestly, I'm, I'm just, I'm too, I'm, I'm too ashamed to admit the fluff no stuff that I was reading. I've been reading mysteries. I've been reading Louise Penny's mysteries. 
um, mm-hmm. which is uh, she's a Canadian author, and um, it's her her inspector is Armand Gamache. Um, yeah, those sell really well at our store. We have uh, we have lots of those. <laughs> they're really good. Yeah. They're um, uh, sometimes they can be a little bit heavy, mm-hmm. but I like mysteries. And that's a good escapism thing too. It is. Yes. Um, I'm a huge, I'm also a huge steampunk fan. So that's the other thing that I read when I'm, I really love all, anything that Gail Carragher ever wrote, the whole mm-hmm. parasol protectorate universe. Mm-hmm. Um, and she had a new one come out not too long ago, which I just devoured. So. Nice. Yes, I love fantasy too. Um, All right, everybody. Uh, Well, good night. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you all next week with uh, Raina Tahir. Good night, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.